Joining us live as Cap from Ogun State is Nigeria's playwright and poet, Noble Roulette, Professor Wole Shoinka. Thank you for joining us, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, like most of us, you've witnessed the lockdown, so to speak, in Ogun State. How has that been for you, sir? My stay has been very, very quiet, very relaxed. I've been able to catch a lot of work and I'm not complaining first. Now, I, I want to ask you for your opinion. How, how well would you rate the, the federal government and how far they've, they've gone in curtailing and putting um, measures in place to curtail the further spread of the coronavirus, COVID-19? Uh, a mixed bag, of course, and I am more conscious of what has been done by states and actually prefer that methodology because they, the uh, leaders in those states are on the ground. Uh, when you talk about lockdown, for instance, there are different kinds of lockdown, different stages, different grades, and those kinds of decisions I prefer for them to be taken by states. Right. And in your opinion, sir, um, would you say our leaders are getting it right or missing it again this time around? Your, our leader, our leader, are you talking about the president? Our leaders, the federal government, our leaders, the federal government. Oh, the federal government, yes. The federal government, um, from the, the, what I would say, the shopping list, which was read out by the president, for instance, there's nothing basically wrong with it. The problem is when people lose confidence in governments, it becomes very serious in emergencies like this. The presidency, you can have a program. Now, who are those who execute the program? How did they come about that program? Some people in the president will be telling people like me to go and write plays about, uh, about a disaster, an epidemic like this. Yes. And if I may use this opportunity, by the way, to make a comment on this. You see, there are people around the presidency who think this is a show to this individual. He said Governor Orton was putting on a show, a performance. This is a mass burial. He said he had a mass world press, uh, lining up coffins, with human beings there, you know, cadavers, and as usual, a show. Go and check the statement of that individual. So you see, it's people like this who make one lose confidence in, at this, uh, with the center, the people who serve that center. That's a human being who thinks the epidemic it's Nollywood. It's Sakaya, Sakajojo show. How do you then trust anything that comes out of a situation like that? Right. See, that's one of the reasons why I insist that uh, decentralization, especially in a crisis like this, is crucial, in fact, to the success of any program for the containment of a disease, of an epidemic. You're dealing with people. You win their trust. You bring them in. You educate them. You don't say like the another governor, for instance, or not. Now, state, this is where the problem is. Yeah. Who said, right? Anybody who tries to escape sanatorium from isolation, that's crazy. That's now, crazy. That's talking like that's the kind of language I expect from the center, not from a state. I'm sorry, you're trying to say something. I, I don't want to be monopolizing. And All right, now, you, Professor. You're not coming. Yeah, now, Professor, recently you were, you were in the news challenging the presidential announcement to lock down some key states. Do you want to shed more light on why you challenged that pronouncement? Yes, I'm asking, if you remember my statement, in fact, I invited the lawgivers and the NBA. I said, please educate us about this. I saw, why are they getting excited? I'll tell you why they're getting excited. Because they know very well that I'm laying the grounds for some future charges against those who control events at the presidency. The charges are enormous. I ask myself very often, who is in charge at the presidency? Who really is in charge? Uh, this is a very big question, and I want you to put it to one side. We're going to deal with it when this crisis is over. And so I asked the MBA and legislators, tell us, does the president really have the constitutional right to deal internally with the movements of citizens? I'm getting to that very point. And at the same time, I'm warning against the uh, opportunism which attaches to crises of this nature. And since then, I received articles printed, uh, sent to me after my statement, New York Times um, and uh, blog sites also, 
who in fact have been investigating this critical issue, which means simply don't for one single moment divert away energy and resources from the crisis, but at the same time, remain vigilant. Simple message. Why are they getting excited? Because they're guilty about something. Now, and we'll deal with that something yeah. in due course. Okay. In the rebuttal that the presidency says you are not qualified to speak on this matter and should rather stick to writing about the experience okay. when it is over. How do you react to this? Yes, yes, the president himself has been very slow. And again, uh, he bears the, you know, the buck stops there. But again, this has to do with the advisors. The same thing during the crisis of the herdsmen. Just see how long it took the president to visit a scene you know, of massacre. There's the people around him always. And exactly the same thing was slow to react as a leader. I watched uh, just yesterday uh, a broadcast on uh, TV from uh, on Sky News, I think. There was a queen who's been brought out, if you like, from mothballs to add her voice to the kind of leadership, kind of leadership uh, speech, attachment, identification, which had already been said by the prime minister of that nation. So even this felt that was not enough. And of course, they acted very, very early. Our president sat there. And then finally, that's why I called him Brib Van Winkle, uh, that he woke up after a long sleep and then started issuing orders. So what goes on there? This crisis goes back several months. The presidential task force was set up sometime in the middle of last month. Now that's not the tempo to take for an epidemic, a pandemic of this nature. And then we get these illiterate, you know, mouthing, shooting their mouths out, talking about, about irrelevances and Nollywood and the performances and so on. So how do we read the president in circumstances like that? That's why I will take orders very happily from the governor at any time, of course, examining it critically. But I know I can pick up my phone or send him a text and say, listen, eh, you're making a mistake here because this is not what we observe. All right. And there are many models to follow. Look at Sweden, for instance. Sweden is not, I'm not saying, again, let me backtrack. I'm not saying lockdown is wrong. I've locked myself here voluntarily. Now it's about three weeks. I'm not complaining. I'm not saying it's not good for the country. But I'm saying that those who can actually choose models are those who are right on the scene, like the governor, the chairman of local councils, etc. So I was going to refer to the model of Sweden, okay. where, for instance, they haven't closed down schools. They have lots of public services running. It's an experiment. It's a gamble. One doesn't say that is perfect. But one is saying that let us always give ourselves options. And those who can decide on those options are those who are closest to the center. And right. those especially who've been active since the epidemic began. Oh, the Professor. collaboration between Ogun State and Lagos, for instance, is something to praise, something to be proud of. You know, it's a model for everybody else. It's a model for the entire nation. Okay. And so when the president then, you know, wakes up and to intervene, I question it. All right, Professor, you did talk about options. In, in your own opinion, what do you think would have been a better alternative or option over the lockdown? Uh, let, let me say this, by the way. I'm not proposing anything as options. I'm just pointing out the fact that there are always options. And that those options are not out of Wallace Schoenka's head, yes. but they're being practiced elsewhere. And they may be wrong for us, they may be right for us. I just want us to be very conscious of those. We're losing people. We lose, and even before the epidemic, look at the number of doctors we lost in the north. Six doctors at a blow to Lhasa. Two, uh, six doctors. Now, that's a large number for us, for the kind of workforce, professional workforce, which we have here. Not to talk of the other virus, the other pandemic, Boko Haram, to which we lost that other virus, to which we lost 47 soldiers. Let me use this opportunity, by the way, to express my condolences to the president, to the head of service, to the soldiers, their families and everything, to let them understand that these things touch us individually. They are not statistics for us. And that is why we inform ourselves. And I don't want to hear any idiot sitting down somewhere 
and presuming that one is talking out of ignorance, which study is. I can talk more about this pandemic and other plagues which have afflicted the world since the beginning of time, much more informatively and intelligently than those who call themselves advisors to the president. So let them learn to listen when we talk and also to get us right. Because nobody is saying don't lock down. If it's necessary to lock down the whole nation for one year, so be it. But let's plan towards it. All right, necessary. Professor. Let us use gradualism. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You want now, to now before, yeah, before this pandemic um, took center stage, we're dealing with a security issue. Um, the Boko Haram insurgents and a whole lot of kidnappings. And that was that was ravaging the country. And, and that seemed to be somehow it's taking the, the back the back seat. Now, in your opinion, what do you think in the light of COVID-19, should the federal government be paying attention to still on our security issue in dealing with the insurgents? Breaking up, but I think I've got the drift of your question. And let me try and answer it in a general way. A new world has to arise from this crisis. I think that's generally agreed globally. But a new nation also has to arrive from this, uh, this crisis. That includes a nation which takes into cognizance, you know, the kind of afflictions which you've mentioned, the kidnappings, ritual killings, the desecration of humanity, uh, the, the, the rape, the violation of infants, the disregard for humanity, treating humanity, as I said earlier, like Hollywood uh, pastiche. So a new nation, we, we won't be part of that future, but we have a responsibility to collaborate with others in the building of that future. I'm in touch with organizations all over the world in the meantime. You will know this. I put my signature to appeals to China, for instance, to release the millions of face masks, masks which that country is hoarding at the moment. I'm in discussion with the units all over the world. We know what is involved. And as far as we're concerned, this thing is already with us. And we're already looking into the future. What sort of society, what sort of a world emerges from this kind of lesson? This really is where I am. I've left COVID, et cetera, to what is possible, to those who are really organized to tackle it. I carry out the instructions on a personal level. A member of my family is, or is right now in quarantine, having I uh, caught it myself, so it's also a personal issue. But even long before that, that phenomenon, that assault on our humanity, uh, this tiny little thing, uh, is something to wonder at and to teach us that we just must come together and ensure that a totally new world, a different world that emerges from this. And charity begins at home. We're yes. going to begin from Nigeria. All right, Professor, just before I let you go, now, Serap is demanding accountability from the federal government in relation to um, the intervention funds and, and money being donated. I just want your two cents on this. Donations, donations. Uh, nothing wrong with donations, if that's your question. Not, not about the donations. Uh, Serap is don demanding for accountability for the intervention fund, all of the donations coming in. Oh, accountability. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm not going to occupy myself with that, believe me. Um, we'll, we'll be chasing money in this country. We're still chasing a bachelor's loot all over the world. Five years from now, we'll probably be trying to track down some donations. I am not going to bother my head with that. But other people should. I'm just saying that. I, I'm just not interested in that right now. I'm just more interested in, in rehumanizing our society. And I, when, now that you mentioned donations, I would like to appeal to those who give to identify uh, units of society, including lower tier uh, governments, um, and, and see if they, let them see if this it won't be more useful and more practical and, and uh, the effects won't be more, more immediately seen if they identify those units and send their money there. I read of one of our billionaires who was giving money to the central bank. Why are you taking money to central bank, for heaven's sake? Central bank should be releasing all its funds to relieve the economic hazard, the, the economic uh, problems which have come about as a result of this pandemic and as a result of measures which are taken to contain the pandemic. So I don't see why money is going to central bank, for instance. If it goes there and it gets lost, don't come to me to come and look for it. That's your oh. business.
All right, Professor, Let, let's talk about palliative. The federal government should put in place or should have put in place before now. We have a whole lot of movement despite the lockdown order, people moving about, and for, for most of it, they say they are hungry and they need to look for food. What's, what's your thoughts on this, sir? The, uh, sorry, again, could you? Politics. Politics. Politics, the federal government should have put in place, and politics that should come in place now to, for this cessation and lockdown order to be fully obeyed, because we find people on the street moving around, and for most of it, they do say they're moving around because they're looking for food. There is hunger. How do you react to this? Um, I don't know. Let me guess your question, because uh, I heard the word food. There should be, yes, a lot of food distribution, release of grains, done methodically. This is the time to empty the granaries, if you like. Let, let, let me tell you something. I, I went, uh, took my um, equipment for a walk in the bush just to get away from my, my desk yesterday. I ran into a fellow hunter, you know. There he was, was looking for food in the forest. He wasn't hunting for relaxation like me, no. I have food in the house, I have drinks in the house. And he came to me, I have his name, I have his number, maybe you'd like to interview him sometime. He said, This is right in the heart of the bush on that side. I had to give him my number, told him to call, to see whether I can. There he is with his family. He has no food for them because of this lockdown, again, unavoidable lockdown. But provisions must be made. If I ran, just walking in the bush, before I was half an hour in there, I ran into this man. Imagine the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of millions of people in the same condition as that individual whom I met in the bush with the shack for maybe so to shoot and feed his family with. So food distribution, if that was your question, is again one of the functions which both federal and state governments can undertake. If uh, cash distribution will help also, I'm always a bit queasy about cash distribution. But if we have this, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. The kind of infrastructure, the kind of preparation of a nation for an emergency like this. Right. If we have the structure on the ground, you stand on and the same works. That is uh, bodies, uh, Red Cross, uh, uh, crossing, um, uh, uh, Crescent. I want to say a very big thank you to Nobel Red Professor Wale Shoinka for give, taking our time to be part of our news on the hour, and we're so grateful for your contribution.